much, everybody. Thank you. So, America continues to wage you all out war to defeat the virus, this horrible, horrible virus. You see how terrible it is, especially when you look at the numbers from yesterday. And we explained why we're extending our nationwide guidelines to slow the spread for 30 days. Together, we have the power to save countless lives. We are attacking the virus on every front with social distancing, economic support for our workers, rapid medical intervention, and very serious innovation, and banning dangerous foreign travel that threatens the health of our people. And we did that early, far earlier than anyone would have thought, and way ahead of anybody else. In this time of need, I know that every American will do their patriotic duty and help us to achieve a total victory. As governments and nations focus on the coronavirus, there's a growing threat that cartels, criminals, terrorists, and other malign actors will try to exploit the situation for their own gain. And we must not let that happen. We will never let that happen. Today, the United States is launching enhanced counter-narcotics operations in the Western Hemisphere to protect the American people from the deadly scourge of illegal narcotics. We must not let the drug cartels exploit the pandemic to threaten American lives. In cooperation with the 22 partner nations, U.S. Southern Command will increase surveillance, disruption, and seizures of drug shipments and provide additional support for eradication efforts, which are going on right now at a record pace. We're deploying additional Navy destroyers, combat ships, aircraft and helicopters, Coast Guard cutters, and Air Force surveillance aircraft, doubling our capabilities in the region. Very importantly, our forces are fully equipped with personnel, protective equipment, and we've taken additional safety measures to ensure our troops remain healthy. Secretary Mark Esper, Attorney General Bill Barr, National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien will provide more details. In addition, I'm going to have uh, General Milley, who's done an incredible job in so many ways, say a few words. And also with us are Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Gilday, who you know, I think you know, and Commandant of the Coast Guard, Admiral Schultz. So I'm going to ask uh, Mark to start, and then we can go. And uh, after that, we're going to take questions as it pertains to this, and then we'll go on to phase two, which is the virus itself. Okay? Thank you. Please, Mark. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today as we make this very important announcement. At a time when the nation and the Department of Defense are focused on protecting the American people from the spread of the coronavirus, we also remain vigilant to the many other threats our country faces. Today, at the President's direction, the Department of Defense, in close cooperation with our interagency partners, began enhanced counter-narcotics operations in the Eastern Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. This initiative is part of the administration's whole-of-government approach to combating the flow of illicit drugs into the United States and protecting the American people from their scourge. I want to thank all of our partners in this effort to include the United States Coast Guard, the Department of Homeland Security, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the Department of Justice, and members of the intelligence community for their tremendous support and cooperation. To get, conduct these enhanced operations, the President has directed the deployment of additional ships, aircraft, and security forces to the United States Southern Command area of responsibility. Included in this force package are Navy destroyers and littoral combat ships, Coast Guard cutters, P-8 patrol aircraft, and elements of an Army Security Force Assistance Brigade. These additional forces will nearly double our capacity to conduct counter-narcotics operations in the region. Additionally, 22 partner nations have joined us in this fight bring with them a variety of intelligence and operations capabilities needed to defeat these criminal organizations. Last year alone, United States Southern Command's operations resulted in the seizure of over 280 metric tons of drugs, much of which was designated for shipment to America. 
While this was an incredible achievement, there is much more work to be done. Transnational criminal organizations continue to threaten our security by smuggling cocaine, fentanyl, methamphetamines, and other narcotics across our borders. These drug traffickers put our communities, communities at risk and destroy lives. Every year, tens of thousands of Americans die from drug overdose, and thousands more suffer the harmful effects of addiction. Furthermore, corrupt actors like the illegitimate Maduro regime in Venezuela rely on the profits derived from the sale of narcotics to maintain their oppressive hold on power. The Venezuelan people continue to suffer tremendously due to Maduro's criminal control over the country. Drug traffickers are seizing on this lawlessness by increasing their illicit activities. We must do more to prevent these drugs from arriving at our shores. These enhanced counter-narcotics operations that are now underway will further disrupt the flow of illicit drugs to America, deny our adversaries the financial resources they depend on, and build the capacity of our partner nations throughout the region. I want to thank President Trump for his leadership and support to this critical mission. This is particularly important time for this operation to begin. As nations around the world shift their focus inward to deal with the coronavirus pandemic, many criminal organizations are attempting to capitalize on this crisis. The enhanced operations we are announcing today will keep the pressure on these criminal groups and protect the American people from the devastation caused by the flow of illegal drugs into our country. Mr. President, thank you for your leadership as we begin this important operation. While the men and women of the United States military work hard here at home to fight the coronavirus, we continue to take action around the world to defend our great country. Thank you, and I'd like to invite General Milley. Thank you, Secretary, for those uh, uh, words, and thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership. And I want to publicly thank uh, Admiral Craig Fowler, the commander of uh, U.S. Southern Command out of Miami, uh, for leading this operation, which is underway effective uh, today. And also Admiral Gilday, uh, the Chief of Naval Operations Admiral Schultz, for their contributions to this from their services. There's thousands of sailors, uh, Coast Guardsmen, uh, soldiers, airmen, Marines involved in this operation. Uh, we came upon some intelligence uh, some time ago uh, that the drug cartels, as a result of COVID-19, were going to try to take advantage of the situation and try to infiltrate additional drugs into our country. As we know, the 70,000 Americans uh, die on an average annual basis uh, to drugs. Uh, that's unacceptable. We're at war with COVID-19, we're at war with terrorists, and we are at war with the drug cartels as well. Uh, this is the United States military. You will not penetrate this country. You will not get past Jump Street. You're not going to come in here and kill additional Americans. And we will marshal whatever assets are required to prevent your entry into this country to kill Americans. So right now, the Navy has marshaled additional Gray Hall ships from both PACOM and UCOM and for the Naval Fleet at Norfolk. And they are set sail already, and they are in the Caribbean right now. In addition to that, there's 10 Coast Guard cutters and there's Special Operations Forces and Security Force Assistance Brigades, along with Air Force uh, reconnaissance aircraft. The bottom line is you're not going to get through. Uh, now is not the time to try to penetrate the United States with illegal drugs to kill Americans. Uh, with the United States military, we will defend our country regardless of the cost. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you, you Secretary. Much, Thank, you. Nope. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for your uh, decisive leadership as we confront this unprecedented uh, challenge uh, posed by corona, coronavirus. And I'd like to thank you for your support for this important initiative and thank uh, all of uh, the Secretary of Defense and all the services uh, for taking on this, uh, this important initiative. Obviously, during this crisis, we're all focused uh, above all else on COVID-19. But at the same time, uh, our law enforcement and national security work must go forward, protecting the American people from the full array uh, of threats. For the Department of Justice, one of our highest priorities must remain destroying the Mexican cartels. Their trafficking is largely responsible for the deaths, as we all know now, of 70,000 Americans a year. Uh, and also, the costs of this don't count uh, the destroyed families, the destroyed lives, the draining of our national uh, treasure as state budgets are crushed by uh, the burden that this, uh, the, the, this uh, 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 narcotic trafficking causes. The President has made clear uh, that we are in this fight against the cartels to win and that we are not interested in half measures and that the threat posed by the cartel is not just a law enforcement threat, but a national security threat as well. 
And in December, building on uh, your success with uh, the Mexican uh, president and forging uh, a cooperative relationship uh, in the area of uh, immigration, you asked me to go down and meet with the president, uh, Lopez Obrador, and our Mexican counterparts to see if we could also establish a more comprehensive and coordinated effort with the Mexicans uh, in confronting the cartels. And uh, we've had some uh, successful visits and, and discussions and currently have an array of activities underway against the cartels. And we anticipate, along with the Mexicans, that these are going to bear fruit in the months ahead. But it quickly became clear that we can obtain the most immediate uh, results, the best bang for the buck, uh, where we increase the assets involved in interdiction on both the Pacific and Atlantic side of Mexico and the Central American uh, countries. For years, the cartels have been uh, using these sea routes to take the cocaine up from principally Colombia, now also out of Venezuela. And these sea routes on both coasts uh, have become the primary means of bringing cocaine up to the United States. Because of the superb work done by the uh, Defense Department and our intelligence community, uh, we know exactly most of the time where these traffickers are at sea. Um, but we're significantly, have been up till now, significantly limited in our ability to interdict because of the numbers of the assets we have deployed. Uh, prior today, uh, this limitation meant we could only intercept the fraction uh, of uh, the, the traffickers that w and, and the, the various boats uh, that were detected. This will now double our capacity, and we are talking about hundreds of tons of cocaine now uh, we're now in a position to seize. So this is going to uh, radically improve uh, our interdiction efforts and put tremendous pressure, we think, on the cartels. Uh, and uh, the effort that Southcom is uh, undertaking is going to save lives by taking drugs off the street. Last week, I announced the unsealing of charges uh, of narco-terrorism, drug trafficking, and other crimes against the former Maduro regime, 16 members of that regime, uh, and their involvement in trafficking of 250 metric tons a year. A lot of that comes by sea, as I discussed at that time. But also, because of the pressure we're applying uh, by our sea uh, interdiction, they are trying to establish an air route out of Venezuela up into Central America, which is one of the reasons we're trying to move firmly against uh, that corrupt regime. Uh, you know, this drug war has gone on for many decades, and at times in the past, We've had great success and great results, and at times we've taken our eye off the ball. Fortunately, not in this administration, and I'm grateful that you, Mr. President, have brought focus to this fight and the determination to use whatever tools are necessary to win the fight. Uh, the cartels have to be defeated, uh, both for the people of this country and for the people of Mexico and Venezuela. So I'd like to thank you again, Mr. President, Secretary Esper, for providing the wherewithal required uh, to help win this war uh, against the cartels uh, and others who seek to send illicit drugs into our country. And with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Ambassador O'Brien. Thank you, General. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today's action is another example of the bold leadership of President Trump and his commitment to protecting the homeland against threats that seek to destabilize the United States and our Western Hemisphere. The uncontrolled flow of illegal drugs into the United States poisons our communities, fuels the dangerous epidemic, uh, epidemic of addiction, and threatens the safety and security of all Americans. The impressive U.S. Navy, Coast Guard, Army, Marine Corps, Air Force, and interagency operation will address a range of threats to our national security posed by narco-traffickers and narco-terrorists. It will reduce illicit financial support for, the drug traf for drug trafficking that provides the corrupt Madero regime in Venezuela and other bad actors with the funds necessary to conduct their malign activities. Under President Trump's leadership, we will continue to execute our maximum pressure policy to counter the Madero regime's malign activities, including drug trafficking. And th this operation will help to choke off the funds that go to that corrupt regime. Madero, narco-terrorist, and criminals 
should make no mistake that even as we are working around the clock to fight the spread of coronavirus, we will continue to execute the President's counter-narcotic strategy. We are working on a number of important national security priorities as we face this public health crisis. The United States will continue to combat disinformation and fake news about this virus. We will work with the world's largest oil producers to address volatility in global oil markets. We will always protect our servicemen and servicewomen around the world, including in Iraq and Afghanistan. I want the American people to know that President Trump and Vice President Pence and their administration are working tirelessly every day to protect the health and well-being of Americans and respond to the coronavirus. Our adversaries should take note, however, this President has a clear-eyed focus on America's national security's security interest. And let me be clear, it would be a mistake, a mistake with terrible consequences for any adversary to attempt to do us harm during this health crisis or ever for that matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. So do we have any questions on sure. this? Because this group is going to go back to work. We're going to leave. Uh, question either for you, Mr. President, or Secretary Esper. Uh, what has changed that is allowing these assets to be deployed now, whereas uh, General Barr said in the past they were not available? Well, for a long time, we've had a lot of drugs coming into our country. And uh, it's not that it's increased. It's where we've probably got it down a little bit, but it's still a tremendous number. Families are being ruined. Lives are being ruined. Uh, it's an incredible thing, especially as you're at this position. You would never believe it. I see things that nobody would believe. I see reports that nobody would believe. So I met with the group behind me, all of them, and we said, what do you think we can do? And they think they can interdict. They think that we can stop it before it gets to the shores. And they're coming from all over the place. And we have uh, incredibly talented people. So I think I'm going to let Mark just give him a little bit of an answer to that. But we just want to see if we can stop a big, a good percentage of the drugs coming into our country. Sure thing. Thanks, Mr. President. So first of all, it's, it's simply a matter of prioritization. The President's given us very clear guidance on what's important to him and protecting the American people. And as some of you know, I began, I began a review months ago looking at all of our different geographic uh, combatant commands and looking at where we can free up time, money, and, and resources to put in, into other endeavors. Uh, in this case, we had scrutinized uh, our inventory fairly closely. The Chairman Milley did a great deal of work on this with uh, with Admiral Gilday, and we felt that uh, there was no risk uh, to the fleet, to our operations, to free up, in this case, uh, uh, naval ships. We also freed up aircraft and other assets to apply them to this presidential priority. And of course, the Coast Guard did the same. So it was a very good operation. We feel this is very important to the American people and completely in line with the president's direction. And how long will you be able to keep up this operational tempo? Well, it depends. What we're going to do is we're going to run it for some matter of time. I'm not going to disclose how long that will be, and then we will assess it, and then we'll make adjustments from there. We may increase, we may decrease, we may sustain as is, but this will be an assessment we will do as an interagency team. We'll report back to the president, and we'll take further guidance from there. And, you know, we didn't do it for this reason, but it'll also have an impact on the virus because we have people trying to get in. So not only drugs, but now we have a new phenomena, and that's at least for the next hopefully short period of time, the virus, so we'll be able to have an impact on that too, please. Yeah, Mr. President, could you expand on that a little bit because you tie it to COVID-19, saying that these yeah. drug cartels were taking advantage of, of the situation, exactly. of this yeah. pandemic. How exactly? Well, because we're focused on so many other parts of the country and even parts of the world. And all of a sudden, areas where we, we had it clamped down pretty tight, for fairness, you know, the wall is up to about 160 miles already. and. Any areas where we have that wall, it's for the most part contiguous. We have fill-ins, but we're up to 161 miles exactly. And uh, any place where you have that wall, other than walking around it on the edges, it's stopping everybody cold. I mean, we're stopping. We, nobody's seen anything like it. That's how good it works. And the other side knew it worked that well. Everybody, because everybody was for it five years ago. All of a sudden, they changed. Uh, it's having a tremendous impact, but. We are now focused on so many different things because of what's happened, because of this horrible, I say it's a horrible phenomena that now we've got to focus on drugs. And the drugs come in from different methods, and we have the best people at sea anywhere in the world. So we'll have a tremendous impact on drugs. But one of the other things will also have an impact, we think, on the, on the virus. Okay. Yeah, please. 
Uh, Ambassador O'Brien, did uh, China underreport uh, both the number of cases and the death toll from the coronavirus? And if that's the case, Mr. President, what does that mean for our relationship with China and your relationship with President Xi? Well, number one, I think the President has a great relationship with President Xi, and we'd like to have a great relationship with China. Uh, unfortunately, we're just not in a position to confirm any of the numbers that are coming out of China. There's no way to confirm any of those numbers. There's lots of public reporting on whether the numbers are are, are too low. Uh, you've got access to those reports that are coming out of Chinese social media and, uh, and and some of the few reporters that are left in China. We just have no way to confirm any of those numbers. Thank you. We really don't know. How do we know whether they underreported or reported however they report? But. Uh, we had a great call the other night. We're working together on a lot of different things, including trade. They're buying a lot. They're spending a lot of money. They're giving it to our farmers. They're paying our farmers for the product. So, you know, we're going we're gonna to continue that along, John. Yeah. I have another one, sir. You tweeted earlier today uh, that there was, uh, you have uncovered intelligence that there is a sneak attack being planned against American uh, troops, American assets in Iraq. Are we talking about Qatayb Hezbollah again? Uh, also, I don't you're saying, but we just have information that they were planning something, and it's very good information. It was uh, led by Iran, uh, not necessarily Iran, but by groups supported by Iran, but that to me is Iran. And we're just saying, don't do it. Don't do it. The it would be a very bad thing for them if they did it. The last time they did do it, in early March at Camp Taji, uh, there was a response from the military against Qatayb Hezbollah and Qatayb Hezbollah alone. Your that tweets was a very powerful response, by the way. That response uh, knocked out five different places, but it also took out a lot of very bad people. Your tweets seem to suggest, though, that if it happens again, it may go up the food chain. Well, that was a very big response. You know, we knocked out a lot. We looked at, they hit one site, we hit five big ones and ammunition sites. You saw that. You saw what happened. And I won't say how many people were killed, but some bad people were killed, and a lot of them. That was a big response. But this response will be bigger if they do something. Yeah, uh, you had one, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just going back to uh, your conversation with President Xi, wondering if you received uh, an intelligence report that talked about the discrepancy in the numbers, and if you addressed that with uh, President We have not Xi. received that, but uh, their numbers seem to be a little bit on the light side, and I'm being nice when I say that, relative to what we witnessed and what was reported. But we discussed that with him, not so much the numbers as what they did and how they're doing. And we're in constant communication with, uh, I mean, I would say the biggest communication is myself and President Xi. The relationship's very good. We have, look, they're spending, they will be spending when things even out. This is obviously a little bit of a hurdle, what's happened over the last month. Uh, but they'll be spending $250 billion buying our product, $50 billion to the farmers alone, $200 billion to other things. They never did that before. So we have a great trade deal, and uh, we'd like to keep it. They'd like to keep it, and the relationship is good. As to whether or not their numbers are accurate, uh, I'm not an accountant from China. Does this things at all in terms of the trade deals? No, because people just don't know. People don't know where, where did it come from. I think we all understand where it came from, and President Xi understands that. We don't have to make a big deal out of it. We didn't like the fact that they said it came from our soldiers, and they haven't pursued that. It was, uh, And that was a mid-level person said that. That was not a high-level person, so I assume I will always assume the best. I'll assume the high-level people didn't know about it. Uh, it was a foolish statement. Uh, so, look, the relationship with China is a good one, and uh, uh, my relationship with him is, you know, really good. Please. Can I follow up just on that point on um, Chinese propaganda that you mentioned as well as uh, Ambassador O'Brien? So, in the past uh, several weeks, China has been shipping uh, PPEs, you know, masks. They've either been yeah. selling or donating everywhere, Africa, Europe. Italy, Russia, and really pushing this narrative that they're taking on a global leadership role in the crisis. So what are your thoughts on that? And is there any plan for well, the administration mind if they want to take on that yeah, role? I, I view that as a positive, if they're helping other countries. We have 151 countries right now that are under siege by the virus, under siege. Uh, some are doing really badly. You know, they don't know about social distancing. These are countries that uh, aren't highly sophisticated. They don't have great communication to the rest of the world. I mean, they don't know the things that we're doing and that some others are able to do. 
And uh, if China can help them, I'm all for it. I'm, I'm for all of us helping everybody. We're soon going to have more ventilators than we need. We're building thousands of ventilators right now. Now it takes a period of time to build them. And again, nobody could have known a thing like this could happen. We're building thousands. We will fairly soon be at a point where we have far more than we can use, even after we stockpile for some future catastrophe, which we hope doesn't happen. Uh, we're going to be distributing them, the extras, around the world. We'll go to Italy, we'll go to France, we'll go to Spain, which is in, you know, very hard hit. On that note, is there any truth on reporting that your administration is stopping shipment of USAID stockpiles of PPEs abroad? No, no truth whatsoever. So no. Your administration no, we is want, I, I would love China and other countries, if they have additional uh, supplies, medical supplies, to give to other countries. 151. So 150. Why would I stop that? Wouldn't that be terrible to stop it? Is the U.S. stopping shipment of our own stockpile through USAID to other countries? No, whatever we have, whatever we've committed to, we commit. But we also need a lot for ourselves. So we're very focused on that until we get over this. So obviously we're not going to be shipping too much until now. We do have excess of certain things and we don't have enough of others. I just had a great talk today with the uh, Doug McMillan from Walmart. And uh, I gave him a very, very big order to, for gowns, for protective gear for the doctors, for the nurses, for everything. And he's actually very excited about it. He's the biggest purchaser of this kind of thing, I mean, of, of, of anything probably in the world. And he is very excited about it. And he said, what size? I said, it's almost un unlimited. When you look at these hospitals, the amount that they order, you almost say, how could they possibly use so much, whether it's masks or the protective gear? But we are supplying a tremendous amount, and we just ordered a lot from Walmart. And he's taken this on personally. And I said, let it go ship. Let it be shipped, not to a warehouse, directly to the side of the hospital or wherever they need it, because we save a lot of time when we do that. So Walmart, in addition to many other companies and people, is now involved at, at the highest level. Please. Um, the announcements uh, that were made today are aimed at um, curbing the flow of narcotics into the country. Are you concerned that we're possibly losing ground on the drug crisis while we're... Um, I don't think we're losing ground, but we don't want to lose ground. That's why we're doing it. I don't want to lose ground. It's a big fight. I've seen many families where they're wiped out because they lost a son or a daughter or a husband or a wife or whatever. We're all of them. And we don't want to lose ground. And. We are heavily focused on the virus, very heavily focused. And with this, we have never, after this goes into effect, which essentially is now, we will never have been so focused on drugs coming into our country as we are right now. And remember, as that wall gets bigger, that really helps us a lot. Really helps us a lot. Yeah, please. Is the Mexican government or any other Latin American government working in conjunction with uh, this operation to help with that drug? Many of the governments are, and Mexico in particular is. And Mexico right now has, we have 27,000 Mexican soldiers on our southern border keeping people out of our country. And we're, very few people are coming into our country right now. And uh, as we complete, again, the wall, in addition to the 27,000 soldiers, it's it's a very it's a very tough place to come into. When I when I took over, people were coming in and they were bringing whatever they wanted. They were bringing drugs of any type, and now it's very hard for them. And it will get harder and harder. But uh, the president of Mexico is a great guy who's really helped us a lot. 27,000 soldiers, 27,000 Mexican soldiers. And you remember when I first took over, they had all of the caravans coming up with 10,000, 15,000 people in the caravans. They were marching through Mexico. Uh, that's not happening anymore. Please, in the back. Mr. President, um, are narco militants such as the FARC 57th Front out of Colombia or the Majuro regime, do you know if they're working in conjunction with the Mexican cartels? Is there any intelligence indicating that? Uh, I cannot tell you that. I can, I know the answer to that. I believe I do, uh, but I cannot tell you that. We have information that would uh, lead us to believe something uh, very powerfully, but I cannot tell you the answer to that. Yeah, please, Jeff. Uh, Mr. President, have U.S. forces in Iraq taken any precautions uh, because yeah, of this sure. particular sure. attack? And have you They're taken precautions? And uh, we are watching it very closely. And if something bad happens, it's going to be very painful for the other side. Have you been in touch with the Iraqi government about this? They know about it, yeah.
they know. Are they offering additional protection? Right, we'll see. They? We'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, we're down to a small force now over the years. Since I got, we've been bringing smaller and smaller. And uh, we're down right now to a small number, but we have very powerful air power there. We have the big base, and uh, which will, you know, I mean, nobody can get near it. And nobody can even get near that. But uh, we've really largely left. You know, we've taken tremendous amounts out. And we've uh, deployed them elsewhere, including bringing some back home. And do you think tweeting about it will help prevent yeah, that from happening? Or perhaps it's, it's, social media. it's social media. It gets out. I have, you know, hundreds of millions of people, number one on Facebook. Did you know I was number one on Facebook? And I just found out I'm number one on Facebook. I thought that was very nice for whatever it means. No, it represents something. And when I can explain to people, just don't do it. You know, it's going to be bad if you do. It's going to be really bad. And they don't need to do it. They have enough problems. Iran has enough problems without doing that. But we've been pulling back very substantially over the last year in Iraq. And uh, so, you know, that's the way it is. You said before you don't want to give the enemy, whoever that is in this case, a heads up. Um, do you feel like maybe you did? No, I'm just giving them a warning. It's not a heads up. I'm giving them a warning. There's a big difference. I'm saying if you do anything to hurt our troops, they're going to they're gonna pay a price. No, they did last time, you know, as per the question. They did last time. We didn't make a big deal out of it, but we hit very, very hard five massive, major ammunition sites. And a lot of people went with it. A lot of bad people. A lot of enemy went with it. And we didn't want to make a big deal out of it, but they paid a big price. They'll pay a much bigger price this time if they do anything. Now that we have Admiral Gilday here, perhaps we could ask a question about what the plans are for the Roosevelt, sir? Sure. In terms of Roosevelt, uh, we're making great progress in terms of testing and also moving, uh, moving people off the ship. So in the past uh, day or so, we've moved over 1,000. Uh, that number will increase to more than 2,700 by Friday as we continue to increase the testing as well and fly those samples off. So we're getting after it uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And will the ship remain fully operational? It is fully operational now. And will remain, and will remain so? It will remain so. What, what protocols are you putting in place to help mitigate the spread of coronavirus among servicemen and women who so, live and so work uh, across the fleet? Before we have any ships getting underway for training exercises, for deployments, they're spending four, those uh, sailors are spending 14 days uh, in quarantine before they get underway. We've increased the amount of testing equipment as well as uh, physicians on board our ships at sea. So we've taken additional steps since the beginning of the uh, COVID and not crisis. not many people are going to be getting off at various ports anymore. Right? I think we Correct. We probably uh, have decided on that. You okay. mean civilians? Thank you. No, uh, military people. I want to add one. I'd like to add one thing to that. There, there seems to be this narrative out there that we should just shut down the entire United States military and address the problem that way. That's not feasible. We have a mission. Our mission is to protect the United States of America and our people. And so we live and work in, in cramped quarters, whether it's a, uh, an aircraft carrier, a submarine, a tank, a bomber. It's the nature of our, of our business. But the chain of command has very clear guidance, and I'm confident between the commanding officers and the senior non-commissioned officers that they're taking every reasonable precaution to make sure we practice as best we can social distancing, uh, sanitizing environments, et cetera, uh, consistent with that mission. And that's what I trust uh, uh, Admiral Gilday, Acting Secretary Moley, and all the other service chiefs and service leaders to do. And I'm confident we'll do that, because keep in mind, we have a job to do, and we will continue to do it, defend the United States of America. Mr. President, you mentioned the stockpile earlier. The Washington Post reported today that the uh, U.S. stockpile is nearly depleted of, of uh, PPE. Is that the case? And if so, how it are you is, planning to because we're sending it directly to hospitals. We don't want it to come to the stockpile because then we have to take it after it arrives and bring it to various states and hospitals. Uh, one of the things, and again, uh, we ask the states to do this as much as possible. Many of the states have uh, people that, whether it's that or clothing, they make clothing, lots of clothing in many of the different states. We said, see if you can get it directly from those manufacturers. Make a deal. Uh, we'll use the Purchase Act if we have to on them. If they won't, uh, by the way, so many people are, the spirit is incredible what they're doing. But we've asked uh, states where they have large manufacturers of different types of equipment to use those local 
uh, factories, those local plants, and have it made directly, ship it right into the hospitals. Uh, we're shipping things right in. We have, as you know, almost 10,000 ventilators, which we need for flexibility. It's a lot. It sounds like a lot, but it's not, because as you see on the board from yesterday, uh, as this scourge, as this plague, as this virus moves, it moves very fast. And we don't know yet whether we're going to need it in Louisiana, in New York, you know, wherever it may be. So we're ready for it. We're totally ready for it. We're going to be shipping out. We've already agreed to ship out over a thousand today to different sites, different locations. But we have to have the flexibility of moving the ventilators to where, to where the virus is going. Uh, and we'll be able to see that, you know, we'll be able to see that from charts a couple of days in advance. So right now we have a nice pile of ventilators. We have a lot more coming in. We have a lot of, I think we have 11 companies making ventilators right now. Uh, very good companies, and they're making them. You know about Ford, you know about General Motors, but we have a lot of companies making the ventilators right now. So uh, now the question is, you know, when you make one, it doesn't get made in 15 minutes. It's not a mask can go quickly. A ventilator takes time to build. It's very, very, as we discussed, it's complex, it's big, it's expensive, you know, et cetera. Uh, but we'll be able to move. We have great flexibility, John. I was just going to say, sir, do you want to move on to solely coronavirus or stick with Yeah, that? I think if, if does anybody have any other questions for this great group of brilliant people? Yes, please. Thank you, Mr. Yes, President. Sure. Uh, question for Secretary Asper. Uh, is the military personnel that's been uh, fanned out across the country to help combat the virus, is there any chance that they're planning to see at some point uh, have those military personnel treat or see COVID-19 patients? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, as you know, we have the hospital ships currently deployed, one in L.A. and one in New York City. Uh, so they are, they will be, they could be treating patients as they come in. We're taking precautionary measures to screen them beforehand uh, to make sure that they're not, uh, they're not exposed, if you will. Uh, same with the military hospitals that we are, we are deploying, certainly, again, to New York, Seattle, and other places. Uh, but the one thing we've got to be careful of where we're, where we're, uh, is that these are deployable assets. They are unique. So if we want to retain the ability to deploy military doctors, uh, expeditionary military hospitals around the country, we've got to preserve and protect them as, as best we can. That said, we remain completely available to assist as need be, as directed by FEMA, as, uh, as the vice president and the president asks us. That's what we commit to do to the American people to help safeguard them and protect them through this, uh, through this virus. So as part of that, they, will they be seeing coronavirus patients or will they strictly be seeing other patients and helping them? They, they could have called upon. I think the best use for them is based on their training and how they're structured and organized is for trauma. We can take the load off of uh, hospitals with regard to their trauma patients, thereby freeing up rooms and other doctors, particularly doctors who are, you know, respiratory nurses or doctors who deal with infectious disease to treat those type of patients. So I think it's the best use of our resources. But again, if push comes to shove, we're prepared to do what we have to to, uh, to assist the American people. At the same time, preserving the medica medical capability we need uh, to, to support our operation and deployed forces abroad. And we're looking at doing two additional brand new hospital ships because these ships have really uh, I mean, they really struck a blow, very positive blow for what they're doing, Go, going to Los Angeles, going into New York. Uh, so we're looking very seriously at building two additional ships of about the same size. Building two new ones or deploying two? Uh, it'll either be, well, building, but we're looking at building either two new ones or doing the renovation of another large ship. But this has really worked out well, so probably two brand new ones. So, Mr. Is this concerning the gentleman, or do you want them? You don't want them to get back to work and <laughs> capture all those bad a, people. A, a follow up, Mr. President, or ahead, Mr. Sure, Secretary. I know that Secretary Wilkie has said he's on standby, waiting to hear if VA hospitals need to be opened. Uh, the doors need to be opened to civilians. True. Are you talking about that? Yes, could we, we see that happen? How, how soon could that happen? Yeah, certain. Uh, I can move very quickly. He's a very capable man. We're ready to move very quickly. Uh, as an example, in uh, Louisiana, they have a very big hospital, so we're looking to move very quickly if we need them. You know, hopefully we won't need them. We're going to find out pretty soon. We're only going to know when, at the time it happens. We prepare for the worst. We are preparing for the worst. Unfortunately, that's the way we have to look at it. Just to follow up on the purpose of these uh, naval ships, uh, you mentioned something about you know treating trauma patients, and I'm just curious, what about things like you know giving birth? Uh, would mothers be expected 
in New York, for example. Well, as I understand, they're not doing that on the ship. That's the one thing they're not doing outside of the COVID-19. Uh, they're not doing that. The, uh, the birth of a baby not being done on the ships. Okay. Can I have a follow-up question with Attorney General Barr, please? This, uh, this has to do with the uh, visa restrictions on immigrant doctors. Uh, is the administration considering easing uh, the restrictions or waiving restrictions uh, for doctors with J-1 or H-1B visas so they can help other doctors uh, during this crisis? Uh, <clears throat> actually, the uh, immigration laws are no longer under the administration of the Department of Justice, and I haven't been participating in any of those discussions. Well, what about you, Mr. President? Please, can you respond to that question, Mr. President? Yes, Your Secretary Asper, um, the WHO, this is on the topic of coronavirus and the Iran. The WHO confirms that Iran is vastly underreporting its coronavirus cases, not just cases, but fatalities. According to on the ground estimates, that it might be as high as 15,500 deaths. 32 commanders in the military in Iran are now confirmed either in dire condition or dead. You have 8% of the parliament now down with coronavirus. So is Iran's soundings of aggressions today that President Trump just tweeted about, do you think strategically, is that a bluff on their part, or is this a sign of very clear desperation? Where are you strategically on that? Well, first and foremost, we empathize for the Iranian people. I mean, they clearly have been hit hard. As you know, I, I think the President's spoken about it, certainly Secretary Pompeo. We've offered assistance, we've offered medical supplies, etc. They have refused that. I, I think if the Iranian regime put more interest in terms of taking care of their people, and in, in, in the context of this virus, they would be better served. Instead, the Iranian regime continues to want to spread its malign activities throughout the region. They want to continue to send out the Quds Force and others to, uh, to, to cause problems throughout the region. We know that in one way, shape, or form, they're either resourcing, directing, approving, or whatever uh, operations for Shia militia groups in uh, Iraq that are targeting American forces. So I think at the end of the day, uh, again, I feel deep concern for the Iranian people. It, what, the important thing is the Iranian government should focus on them and stop this malign behavior that they've been conducting now for over 40 years. I think the entire region and certainly the Iranian people would be better off for it. And I happen to think they want to make a deal. They just don't know really how to start. And they've been given some bad advice by former Secretary Kerry. Some very bad advice. And I really think they want to make a deal, which is the Logan Act, but we'd have to look at the Logan Act. All you have to do is take a look. I think they've been given very bad advice by Secretary Kerry. I think that um, I think they're dying to make a deal. Look, their country's in trouble. Their economics are shot. Uh, they're in, they've got a lot of bad things going. I think they'd like to make a deal. They can get it settled very quickly. No nuclear weapons. No nuclear weapons. They can't have nuclear weapons. It's very simple. Okay, uh, let's let these folks get back to work. Is that okay? Thank you all very much. So as we deploy our service members to combat both threats abroad, invisible enemy at home, earlier today I spoke to our nation's incredible warriors and military families. Spent a long time on the phone with thousands and thousands of families that were hooked in. In order to stop the spread of the virus, some of these families have delayed planned moves to their next duty station. And in other cases, military families are also waiting longer to welcome home the heroes from deployment. There's a tremendous burden to bear, and the families have been involved with us for so long, and they are incredible. Without the families, they couldn't be the great service members that they turned out to be, and they understand that. And I must say, protecting our military families is our top priority. So they understand what they're, what's happening with respect to the virus, and uh, they understand it well. They've been fantastic. As Commander-in-Chief, I'm deeply grateful for our service members, their spouses and their children whose love, devotion, and sacrifice keeps America strong. To make, procure, and deliver crucial medical supplies to our doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers, my administration is leveraging the might of American manufacturing, supply chains, and innovators across the 
industry and across every industry. And I just told you about Walmart, and I could tell you about many more. Hanes is making protective gear and masks, and we're making uh, tremendous amounts of product. There's never been anything like it. At the same time, I tell the governors, get it yourself if you can from your local companies and your local warehouses and factories. If you can do that, you should do that. Because of the actions that we've taken under the Defense Production Act, manufacturers and suppliers are sharing with FEMA and HHS their planned orders and allocations to states and to hospitals all over the region. This enables FEMA and HHS to work closely with states, local governments, and private sector to allocate critical resources to highly impacted areas. Working together, we're entirely focused on getting materials to the right place at the right time. So we wanted to go directly to a hospital or directly to a certain state location, and ideally not even hit the state's warehouses. If we can avoid the warehouses, it's even better because they go directly into a hospital. And one example of that is Ohio, the great state of Ohio. Senator Rob Portman called today, and he uh, asked for some help and got us, uh, did a tremendous job, along with uh, Mike DeWine, the great governor of Ohio, to facilitate a donation of 2.2 million gowns. 2.2 million gowns. Think of what that is, 2.2 million to the strategic national stockpile from Ohio-based Cardinal Health. Cardinal Health, we appreciate it. And they're making much more than that and different types of things. We're profoundly grateful for their contribution to protect the lives and safety of our healthcare professionals. Cardinal's been working with us very well. FEMA and HHS formed a historic partnership with the private sector called Project Airbridge to bring supplies from other countries to the United States, including gloves, gowns, goggles, and masks. These supplies will soon be distributed around the country. We have large cargo planes coming in from various parts of the world. Every day, new plane loads are landing in cities such as New York, Miami, Chicago, Los Angeles. Additional flights have been scheduled, and we're adding more and more. And uh, they're actually coming in ahead of schedule. A lot of these flights are coming in with a lot of material ahead of schedule. Uh, the amount of usage, the amount of need uh, is something that nobody's ever seen before. We are getting so much, but uh, no matter how much we get, they seem to use it up very quickly. More than 17,000 National Guard personnel have now been activated all across our country. On Tuesday, the Vice President sent a letter to the governors calling on them to have plans in place to use the National Guard to move medical supplies from warehouses to hospitals. So a lot of times we'll deliver supplies to a warehouse in a state, someplace in New York or in New Jersey or uh, in Connecticut or wherever it may be. And uh, they're having difficulty getting it moved. So what we're doing, if we don't bring it directly to the hospital, is we've authorized, it was a special authorization, the National Guard to go into that uh, facility and to move it for the state. So the, the National Guard is moving a lot of this equipment and medical supplies into a hospital or into an area where it's needed by the state. As I said yesterday, difficult days are ahead for our nation. We are going to have a couple of weeks, starting pretty much uh, now, but especially a few days from now, that are going to be horrific. But even in the most challenging of times, Americans do not despair. We do not give in to fear. We pull together, we persevere, and we overcome, and we win. This week, every American heart is joined with the people of New York as they continue to bear the brunt of the pandemic. To every New Yorker, please know that we are by your side. I love New York. And every day, we will be with you. And it could very well be that others take over from New York. Uh, there are some areas, some hot spots in other states that are really uh, exploding. Some, like Louisiana, were very late. And then all of a sudden, it was like an explosion. In confronting this deadly plague, America is armed with capabilities never dreamed of in past centuries. You look at 1917, the pandemic, it was something ravaged parts of this country, but ravaged Europe, ravaged. They say 75 to 100 million 
Some people say 50 to 75 million people died. Think of that. And that was a long time ago, over 100 years ago. Uh, very, very uh, many books written about the 1917-1918 pandemic. Our doctors are poring over the virus genetic code, designing potential therapies and vaccines. Our planes are airlifting supplies from every corner of the earth. We're watching other countries and they're watching us to see whether or not and who's going to be the first to come up with a cure or a uh, remedy of some kind or even a help if it can help. And of course, a vaccine. We're looking very strongly for a vaccine. Johnson & Johnson is doing well and other com companies are doing very well. But our most powerful asset, our greatest weapon in this effort is the spirit of our people. And uh, we want to keep away, keep a distance, keep away. If you don't get it, that solves a lot of problems. If you don't get it, and you can't get it if you keep the distance. American spirit is unyielding, unwavering, and unbreakable. It's incredible. I've never seen anything like it, the way the, way, uh, the people have pulled together the unity of this country. So together, we're going to win this war. And the sooner we do, the sooner we can begin to rebuild. And we're ready to rebound and return to normal lives. We went from the best economy in the history of the world, the best economy that this country has ever seen, the best employment numbers we've ever had, 160 million people working, almost 160 million, to a point where the professionals came to me and they say, sir, you're going to have to shut the country down. I said, what does that mean? They said, sir, you're going to have to shut it down. And we're going to build it up, and I think we're going to build it up fast. I think we're going to have a tremendous rebound. And there's a, a great energy and a great pent-up demand. And as you know, phase three was terrific, and phase four, what passed in Congress, and phase four, if that happens, will be great. I already proposed a paying almost zero interest on bonds. And I proposed a $2 trillion infrastructure plan, which would not only fix our roads and highways and bridges and tunnels and other things, but will also do something very good. It's called jobs. I'm also asking that restaurants and entertainment facilities uh, go back to the old uh, deductibility from corporations where corporations can buy, because otherwise a lot of these restaurants are going to have a hard time reopening. It takes a long time, and they're going to have a hard time reopening. So we're asking for going back to deductibility where corporations can buy and corporations can go out to lunch and they pay and they get a deduction on what they eat. They get a deduction on the bill. and. Uh, same with the entertainment. It's going to bring a lot of people back. I think it'll open up the restaurant business. People forget that years ago they had that. And when they got rid of it, when they ended it, for whatever reason, but they ended it, uh, many, many restaurants went out of business. Many entertainment-type facilities went out of business. And now's a great time to bring it back. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a terrible time for that business after they ended it. But this is a great time to bring it back. It'll keep our restaurants going. In fact, I think the restaurant business will be actually bigger and better than it is right now. So we're also talking about that. And now what we'll do is we'll take some questions. And I see Mike is back with some of the folks. That's great, Dr. Fauci. And uh, we will, uh, oh, how are you? Thank you, Deborah. So we'll take some questions and uh, we make progress day by day, please. Um, Mr. President, so yesterday you were talking about a friend you had who was in a coma. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry to hear your friends going through that. Um, but you said this is no flu. Um, there's still some people who kind of think of this as the flu. And over the past month, you've compared it to the flu sometimes, saying treat it like the flu or, uh, you know, what treat it how we handle the flu. So what changed your thinking on that or your I language? I think the on severity. That? I think also in looking at the way the, the contagion, the, it is so contagious. Nobody's ever seen anything like this where large groups of people all of a sudden just by being in the presence of somebody have it. The flu has never been like that. And there is a, a flu is contagious, but nothing like we've ever seen here. Also, the violence of it, if, if it hits the right person, and you know what those stats are, if it hits the right person, that person's in deep trouble. And uh, my friend was the right person. 
when you heard about that with your friend, like, was that a, a turning point? Yeah, well, not a that? turning point. No, before that, I knew how, because I'm seeing numbers and I'm seeing statistics that are, uh, you know, not exactly very good. So, but but it hit him very hard. Uh, he's strong, a very strong kind of a guy, but he's older, he's heavier, and he's sort of central casting for what we're talking about, and it hit him very hard. I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, John? Mr. President, um, and maybe this is a question as well for Dr. Burks or Dr. Fauci. Um, Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted last night, and we checked today, that there are still flights that are running between hotspots like New York and Detroit, uh, New Orleans as well. A number of flights uh, were completed today. Uh, Senator Graham's point is if you're going to declare mitigation, should it not be full mitigation yeah. and you stop people from traveling? Well, we're thinking inside. about doing that. At the same time, we just, you know, to start these airlines and to start this whole thing over again is very tough, John. It's very tough. And you have them going, in some cases, from hotspot to hotspot. If you notice, they're usually hotspot to hotspot. Uh, very few flights, New York to Miami. Uh, and uh, but we're we're thinking we're certainly looking at it. But once you do that, you really are, you really are uh, clamping down an industry that is desperately needed. But how do you make that calculation as to whether or not you you keep the industry well, going or your risks yeah. spreading contagion? That, that is a calculation that we're looking at right now. We're looking at it very strongly. Please. So let me follow up to that, Mr. President. Not every governor has issued a stay-at-home order. All of you have made it very clear how important it is to stay home, that we are in a dire situation here. And that's how you stop the spread, is staying yeah, home. Sure. Why not take the power out of the hands of the governors and you just issue a stay-at-home yeah. order for every because state states in this are different. country? states are different. And I understand that governor of Florida, great governor, Ron DeSantis, uh, issued one today. And uh, that's good. That's great. But there are some states that are different. There are some states that don't have much of a problem. There are some, well, they don't have the problem. They don't have thousands of people that are positive or thousands of people that even think they might have it or hundreds of people in some cases. So uh, you have to look, you have to look at, at states. You have to give a little bit of flexibility. We have a state uh, in the Midwest or if Alaska, as an example, uh, doesn't have a problem, it's awfully tough to say, close it down. So we have to have a little bit of flexibility. Look, we're helping governors. We're really here to help governors. They're the front line of attack. And that includes in purchasing, by the way. We're here, and we're backing them up. And there's never been a backup like we've given them. We've given them billions of dollars' worth of things, medical supplies and ventilators, thousands and thousands of ventilators. We have thousands under construction right now. Uh, we have thousands ready to go in case they need it. There's never been anything like this. I mean, we've, they've done really, the people uh, have done incredibly. We're building hospitals all over the country. We're building hospitals right now at a rate that has never even been contemplated before. They're mobile hospitals, but they're really not mobile. I mean, they're incredible structures. But we're building many hospitals, Louisiana, New Jersey, New York, we just finished a, a massive hospital complex. And we also have uh, medical centers built in New York. I mean, we're building hospitals at the rate that this country has never done before. And uh, hopefully it's all going to work out. Follow up on your back, Mr. Sir. Uh, this is Mr. President, I just want to make sure we're clear. On the planes, are you looking at just uh, curtailing routes uh, between certain hot spots, or is it broadly? Well, we're, gonna, we're looking at the whole thing, because we're getting into a position now where we want to do that. We have to do that. And so we're looking at the whole thing. Yes. Okay, so, and we may, have, we may have some recommendations. My second question on economics. Uh, just with oil, um, oil prices are very low. Yeah. The Saudis have increased production. Uh, I know that you've spoken about liking low oil prices, but then there's also the industry aspect. It's like from 1950, these oil prices. So and that's what, when they had big dollars, big so, beautiful dollars. So do you, do you advocate cuts? Do you advocate cuts to production? Do you... Well, look, we have a great oil industry, and the oil industry is being ravaged. And as you know, Russia, and I spoke to President Putin, we had a great call. Russia, Saudi Arabia, I spoke with the Crown Prince, so we had a great call. But um, I think that they will work it out over the next few days. If you ask me, I think it's just, it's too simple not to be able to. They both know what they 
have to do. So I think I have confidence in both that they'll be able to work it out. But it's uh, — it has ravaged an industry worldwide, not here. I mean, worldwide, the oil industry has been ravaged. So there was a lot of oil production to start off with. And then on top of it, it got hit with the virus. And business went down 35, 40 percent. So that — that business is a tough one. And, you know, they have — uh, ships all over the sea. I told you yesterday, all over the sea, massive tankers that they're using for storage. They go out and they just sit there. There's no place to go. They have massive amounts. Now, uh, uh, gasoline's going to be 99 cents a gallon and less. You know that. That's already starting. It's popping up. 99 cents. So that's like giving a massive tax cut to people of our country. When we try and get the airlines going, if if fuel is costing much less, it helps with getting the airlines, which is always a tough business, always has been a tough business. But with that being said, look, I'm, I want to get that industry back where it was. We were doing records in that industry also. We want to get it back to where it was. So I think that Saudi Arabia, Russia, they're negotiating, they're talking, and I think they'll come up with something. Uh, I'm going to meet with the oil companies on Friday. I'm going to meet with uh, independent oil producers also on Friday or Saturday maybe Sunday. Uh, but we're having a lot of meetings on it. I think I know what to do to solve it. But if if they're unable to solve it, then I think I know what to do to solve it. Or can you give well, us a glimpse we of We won't mention here. it now, but it's, it's tough. Uh, I think I know what to do to solve it. We don't want to lose our great oil companies. You know, we're the number one producer of oil in the world. And uh, a month ago when you said that, it was great. Today when you say it, it's not so meaningful. But uh, — I do believe there's a way that that can be solved, or pretty well solved, and I'd rather not do that. I think that Russia and Saudi Arabia at some point are going to make a deal in the not-too-distant future, because it's very bad for Russia. It's very bad for Saudi Arabia. And it's very bad. I mean, it's bad for both. So I think they're going to make a deal. You know, the free market is a uh, wonderful thing. It's amazing how it can work. But I think they're going to make a deal. Yeah. Yeah, please, Mr. President, a couple of questions, one for you, one for Mr. Wolf, if possible. Um, over 5 million immigrants in this country do pay taxes through their IT numbers, yet they will not receive any money um, in their stimulus package. And no undocumented immigrant will receive any aid from the government during this crisis. How do you suppose they survive during the COVID-19? Well, you know, you're saying undocumented, meaning they came in illegally. And a lot of people would say, we have uh, a lot of citizens right now that won't be working. So what are you going to do? It's a tough thing. It's a very terrible — it's a very sad question, I must be honest with you. But they came in illegally. And uh, we have a lot of people that are citizens of our country that won't be able to have jobs. Now, I do think once we get rid of the virus, I think we're going to have a boom economy. I think it's going to go up rather quickly, maybe very quickly and maybe slowly. But it's going to go up, and it'll all come back. And I think it's actually going to come back stronger than what it was because of the stimulus. Uh, but it's a, it's a really uh, sad situation, and we are working on it. I will tell you, I'm not going to give you a hard and fast answer, because I just want to tell you, it's something I think about, uh, and it's something we're working on. Please. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, question for Dr. Fauci. Uh, Looking beyond when we're on the other side of this curve, are we looking at living with some sort of social distancing guidelines essentially, essentially until there's treatment or a vaccine? For example, people looking forward to the summer talk about you know, going to baseball games, going to concerts. We have political conventions over the summer. Are things like that possible or safe without a vaccine or a treatment in place? Yeah, I think if we get to the part of the curve that uh, Dr. Burke showed yesterday when it goes down to essentially no new cases, no deaths at a period of time, I think it makes sense that you're going to have to relax social dis uh, distancing. The one thing we hopefully would have in place, and I believe we will have in place, is a much more robust system to be able to identify someone who's infected, isolate them, and then do contact tracing. Because if you have a really good um, program of containment, that prevents you from ever having to get into mitigation. We're in mitigation right now. That's what the social and, and physical distancing is. The ultimate 
the ultimate solution to a virus that might keep coming back would be a vaccine. Uh, in fact, I, I was on the weekly conference call with the WHO-sponsored group of all the health leaders in the world who are dealing with this. And we all came to the agreement that we may have cycling with another season. We'll be much better prepared. We likely will have interventions. But the ultimate game changer in this will be a vaccine, the same way a vaccine for other diseases that were scourges in the past that now we don't even worry about. And Tony, how are they, how are they doing with the vaccine stuff? I mean, the vaccine is, is, as I said, it's on target. We're still in phase one. There were three doses that we had a test. We've been through the first two doses. We're on the highest dose now. When we get that data, it'll take a few months to get the data to feel confident to go to the phase two. And then a few months from now, we'll be in phase two. And I think we're right on target to the year to a year and a half. And do you mind me asking uh, you and Dr. Burks, uh, have either of you received threats of any kind, or have you been given a security detail, given that you've been out here every day on camera speaking? Well, I mean, I, anything that has to do with security detail, I'd have to have you refer that question to the Inspector General of HHS rather than my answer that. Can I follow up on uh, testing? Here's the need security. Everybody loves them. Can I follow up on testing? Sounds like they'd be in big trouble if they ever attack. You know? He was a great basketball player. Did anybody know that? He was a little on the short side for the NBA, but he was talented. He, he won a game, I read this story, he won a game that was unwinnable against a great team, and his whole team said, we can't beat this team, and he went in and they won the game, right? That was a couple of years ago. But a few years ago. The head never changes. <laughs> the attitude never changes. Could, 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 I, could I ask Dr. Fauci? Yes, please. please. I know he loves being up behind the podium. He so does. Much. <laughs> it's like pulling teeth, like going yeah. to the dentist. Um, I don't want to hit you with everything that's coming along, but a lot of people who are watching television today heard from a, a researcher named Dr. Jacob Granville, who's come up with a potential antibody therapy that he has given to USAMRID. I uh, just wanted to know if you know anything about this, what you might be able to tell people at home about it who have seen it. You know, John, I'm, I don't know specifically this individual, what they're doing, but I can tell you there's a lot of activity that is centered around a passive transfer of antibodies in the form of convalescent plasma, one. The number is to get immune globulin that you precipitate out of the plasma, and another is monoclonal antibody. It's based on the same principle of if you have a protective antibody, passive transfer of that could provide not only protection prophylactically, but also treatment. This is an old concept. In fact, immunology was born decades and decades and decades ago with the concept of giving passive transfer of serum to an individual to protect them from an infection. So it's, I wouldn't be surprised if he and a number of other people are pursuing this. It's the right thing to do. Can I follow up on antibody testing, please, Dr. Fauci? At what point can we as a country expect there to be a widespread antibody testing so we know exactly what we're dealing with here, as well as other questions such as, you know, when can people who are deemed to be healthy donate blood, for example? <clears throat> Okay, so when you talk about antibody testing, there are a couple of things that you want to do. You want to find out if someone has been infected and whether or not they're going to ultimately wind up being protected. Antibody testing right now is not the first thing on our priority. It's something that we need to do is testing to see if someone is infected. It is very important ultimately to be able to get a feel for what the penetrance of the infection was in society for a number of reasons. You get a better feel of what the impact has been, but also you get a better feel of what the herd immunity would be. So I can foresee in the future that when we get the facility, which we'll have for sure, I mean, ultimately you can get a test that could do this reasonably easy, and do the kind of what we call zero surveillance study. This is very analogous that Dr. Burks and I were talking about that uh, a lot. <laughs> and that is back in the day when she and I were both doing the HIV AIDS issues back when we first discovered the virus in 83 and we had an antibody test in 1985, we found out by serial surveillance representative in different populations that we were dealing with the tip of the iceberg when we saw individuals who were the ones who actually got infected. It gave us a really good feel for how many people were infected how many are doing well and how many are getting ill? I foresee that we'll have that same sort of information, which will be important information. But right now, that's not our immediate problem. I know 
not your priority, but can you give a sense of whether what will happen this year? Let me just follow up with that because I think. Um, as I discussed before, we had great, I just want to thank all the epidemiologists and scientists out there who worked with us over the last four weeks on models. They really, um, many came forward and really supported us. Right now we're in talks with a whole series of universities. We have the most brilliant scientists um, in the world and our universities in state after state. Some of them public health universities, some of them basic science. All of them have received NIH grants for HIV or other development of assays in the past. I've talked to a lot of them over the last few days to really ask them to develop these simple ELISA tests that could be used rapidly in their healthcare centers. Because immediately, with a it's easy to do. We've all developed ELISAs. So in a day or two after development, they could screen their entire hospital. I think that would be very reassuring to the healthcare workers who have been on the front line. We worry about them every day. And so I've really called on every university and every state to develop ELISAs. Um, you can buy the antigens and the controls online and really work to test entire healthcare communities in your states and support them that way. At the same time, we worked um, in sub-Saharan Africa in what we call dry blood spots. So we're looking at could you use that in a community while we work on the point of care test where you just dot blood onto this paper and then that can go into the lab and be analyzed. That would allow us to look in nursing homes and other long-term care facilities immediately. And then finally, we've reached out to the developers of the rapid test, the ones who developed it for malaria, the ones that developed them for HIV. It's exactly the same concept and process to ask them to rapidly develop these tests because I think we owe it to the frontline health care providers, not only to provide them RNA tests, but many of them have been on the front line now for four weeks, may have become exposed. We now know they're asymptomatic. And I think really being able to tell them the peace of mind that would come from knowing you already were infected, you have antibody, you're safe from reinfection 99.9% .9 of the time. And so this, I think, would be very reassuring to our frontline healthcare workers. And our universities can do that by Friday. So I'm putting that challenge out to them to really work on that and do that. That's what we did in the early days. We had ELISA's up and running within days of having the antigen. And so this is what's really possible. So we're not waiting. We're asking for help now. So potentially this could happen soon, even within this month, if people take that It could happen soon challenge? within this month, if the universities help us, absolutely. Um, Dr. Burgess, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, I'm Florida. Okay. Governor Just, DeSantis says that he spoke with you before issuing his state he did. order. He spoke to me this morning. He uh, has some loopholes in that for- I don't know, no, he well, spoke for, to me this morning. He for knows religious events, for example, Very good large judgment. religious groups can meet together. Now that doesn't really who can, agree. Who can? Religious groups like churches can meet. That, but he did speak to me this morning. We talked about it. But Please. Yeah. Full well, mitigation, governor. sir. Does that go against your Back model? Because that's not full mitigation. I don't know. I'd have to look at what he did. Back to the health care workers on the front lines, following up with Dr. Burks as well. Hazard pay. Uh, you have said you have wanted that uh, for the health care workers on the, the front lines. I know Secretary Mnuchin has mentioned something about that possibly in the like fourth it. level of the stimulus. I package. like it. But can you make it happen now? Do we have to wait for? A fourth well, I think it's something we're discussing in terms of bonus or bonus pay. It doesn't have to be called hazard pay. It could be called, hey, look, I watch those people go into hospitals that I know. I talked about one of them, right? But I watch them walk into those hospitals, and they walk in men, women, young, middle-aged, not so many older ones. And I watch, I watch them. They're almost like, and I think I take the word almost out, they're like warriors. They're going in. People are cheering. Where there's a building across the street, the people are screaming. They're clapping. They're, they're like heroes. Up, the Empire State Building. No, no. I, I will tell you. I think it's incredible. What's they're the like they're like warriors. They're like soldiers, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna be doing something for them. So whether it's bonus, because you know we're hopefully gonna be over this relatively quickly. It's gonna be vicious for a period of time, but hopefully we're gonna be over this. You have a lot of questions today. Look at you. There's you know one. this young lady behind I've you? I've never met her before in my life. <laughs> We're practicing social distancing. That's good. That's a good idea. It makes our marriage strong. That's good for a marriage, right? Um, there, there are a lot of people who are worried about getting sick and do they end up in a hospital, people who are uninsured, 
and will they be crushed by medical bills? You were considering last month, last month already in March, reopening the healthcare.gov exchanges. There has been a determination not to do that. Could you tell us what the rationale was behind that okay, decision might, and, and what yeah. would you have as an alternative? Okay, they took that up under the task force and make, maybe Mike, you want to say a few words about that? Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And uh, uh, what I can tell you is that the President has made a priority from the outset uh, of our task force work to make sure every American knows that they can have a coronavirus and they don't have to worry about the cost. And we were very inspired as well um, because of the President's engagement with the leading health insurance companies in the country that now, so far, Two of the top health insurance companies in America have announced that they're not only willing to waive copays on testing, uh, and now testing is fully covered because of the bill the president signed for every American, but also that these two insurance companies have waived copays on all coronavirus treatment. And I can assure you that as Congress and the president and the administration begin to discuss the next piece of legislation, uh, we're going to make sure that Americans have those costs uh, compensated and covered. Our priority right now is, is, is ensuring that every American uh, takes the 30 days to slow the spread to heart. Uh, the best thing we can do uh, for one another, for our family's health, for the most vulnerable among us, is practice those mitigation uh, strategies that the President outlined yesterday for the next 30 days. We're dealing with testing to make sure that every American can have a test uh, that needs one. We're dealing, uh, we're dealing with supplies and, and we're making great progress in, in building personal protective equipment and ensuring that ventilators are available, particularly for the communities most impacted. Uh, but the American people uh, can be confident that as we move into this, we're going to make sure that our health care workers are properly compensated for their extraordinary and courageous work. And, uh, and we'll make sure that the, the financial burden on those who uh, end up contracting the coronavirus and dealing with its most serious uh, symptoms uh, also uh, can, be, can, can deal with those issues and deal with those costs. I understood, Mr. Vice President, but there will be people who don't have insurance who get sick before any of these mitigation uh, efforts are, are put into place. And without opening the health care exchanges, where can they find insurance, people who aren't insured by these companies that are covering the cost of the copay? Where can people go now to get health insurance if they get sick, before they get sick? Well, all across America, we have Medicaid uh, for underprivileged Americans. And at the President's direction, the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services has given unprecedented waivers for states to expand coverage for coronavirus testing and treatment. We've also extended waivers for Medicare administration to make sure that people have access to that coverage. But we're going to continue to bring uh, opportunities to the president. The traditional systems of Medicaid in particular for the uninsured uh, in America. Could you expand that to cover middle class people? Well, I, the, I think what we're seeing health insurance companies do today, John, is really inspiring. I mean, but, one, but of the, again, one of the Vice things, President, that, I'm sorry, one of the things that's point, characterized that's for people the President's who, approach that's for here. people who already have insurance. Well, yeah. one of the things that's, that has animated and, and uh, characterized the President's approach is the way he's engaged American businesses to step up and do their part. And as the President said many times, uh, we're, we're inspired by the spirit of American businesses. I was at a distribution center for Walmart today in Southern Virginia. And I saw the way this company that literally has already hired thousands of people, these workers are coming to work, the truck drivers are coming to work, farmers are working in the field, grocery stores made a commitment to the president a month ago that no grocery store in America would close down. The food supply is strong. Uh, we're getting food on the table of every American. But it's because the president went to these leaders and said, we need you to step up and do your part. We, we engaged health insurance executives early on in this process uh, to waive, uh, to waive co-pays on coronavirus testing. And, and because of the engagement and, frankly, because of that, that patriotic and compassionate spirit that's being reflected, we've already seen two of the largest insurance companies in the country announce that they're going to be providing full coverage, free of charge for coronavirus treatment. 
I fully expect, I think as the president does too, that we'll see more of that for people that have insurance. We'll continue to provide flexibility for Medicaid for people that don't have insurance. And we'll make sure that Medicare has the flexibility to meet this moment. For seniors, when we remember that seniors with underlying health conditions are the, are the most vulnerable to serious outcomes from the coronavirus, but uh, we'll get through this using the full weight of the federal government and the full strength of the American economy. John, I think, this, I think it's a very fair question, though, and it's something we're really going to look at because it doesn't seem fair. If you have it, you have a big advantage, and at a certain income level, you do. I think it's one of the greatest answers I've ever heard because Mike was able to speak for five minutes and not even touch your question. No. So I said, I said, that's what you call a great professional. But l let me just tell you, you really are, you, it's really a fair question, and it's something we're looking at. Well, I think it's I, I mean, just in terms of a fair question or not, I always endeavor to ask fair questions, but this is a huge worry yeah, yeah. for people in this country who were in that donut hole. We're they don't have. It. They don't have commercial insurance. They don't qualify for Medicaid. Right. What do there they certain, do? And it's a pretty big group. We're looking at it. I mean, we spent the entire 2000 election talking about the donut hole, and it's still there. Yeah, we are. Uh, I haven't been up there yet, though. You know, the uh, other people have been talking about it. No, I mean, and they haven't spoken. This was 20 years ago. We were talking about it. Yeah, but they're Who talking about it. They're talking about it. I know, but they're talking about it in the 2020 election too, and nobody's gotten to it. Nobody's talked about it at all. It, Mr. President, I think we will. Yeah, I think we're going to get to it. I think we're going to get to it. I don't. Think, I don't think the other group will get to it. They haven't even spoken about it, and it's a big group of people. Are you, are you committing that there's No, I'm not committing, but it's something we're going to look at. I can't commit. I have to get approval from it. I have a thing called Congress, but it's something we're going to look at, and we have been looking at it. In yeah. the, you, you mentioned in this congressional bill, the next, the sort of phase four, you would like to see something. If there is a there. phase four, but oh, we're, okay. we're certainly looking at certain things. We want to help restaurants, entertainment. We want to help because it's jobs, not that restaurants, it's jobs, tremendous amounts of jobs. Uh, so we're looking at that. We're looking at infrastructure. I mean, we think of it. We will have spent eight trillion dollars, and you know, it's way back, we're way pulled back. But we will have spent eight trillion dollars in the Middle East, and yet our roads are in bad shape, our bridges, our tunnels, bad shape, and we're going to be the talk of the world again soon. But we want two trillion. We will have spent in the Middle East, and all we got out of it was death and cost. But all we got out of it was death. Millions of people. You have to look at the other side, too. Millions and millions of people killed. Our great soldiers, thousands killed, so many wounded, hurt. And yet, when we want to go and fix a road someplace, we want to do what we want to do in our country. No, it's time that we spend money on our country. That's what we're going to do. It's time that we start spending on our roads and our bridges and our schools and all of the things that we're supposed to be spending on. And people are finally getting used to it. And you could look at all of what we've done in the Middle East, way back in so many different places, way back in other countries, too, by the way. And I've gone to other countries that are very rich. I said, I'm sorry, you're going to have to reimburse us for our costs. They don't even want to know what I'm talking about. It takes them 20 minutes to figure it out because nobody's ever asked them to do that. And they're doing it. They're doing it, and they have no choice. They have to do it. So uh, it's time that we start spending on the USA. Okay, please. Mr. President, this is a question for the Vice President. On March 9th, you said one million tests had been delivered, and another four million would be delivered by the end of the week. That clearly did not happen. What happened with those projections? What went wrong? Well, I think the test kits were delivered, according to HHS. but. The difference is between receiving a test and the ability to rapidly produce a result to that test. And frankly, because of the public-private partnership that the President initiated now more than a month ago with our massive commercial laboratories across the country, uh, our team was reported today that uh, we're now doing more than 100,000 tests a day. Uh, more than 1.2 million tests have been performed. Uh, states have established drive-through sites all across the country. In fact, uh, states have been so successful with the community-based and drive-through testing that we're working to transition over completely 
all of the federal work on drive-through testing uh, and, and have the states completely manage that process. So but you're saying 4 million tests were delivered by the end of that week? Uh, HHS was very busy from early in the year uh, delivering test kits around the country. But the difference was, as the president said many times, we had an antiquated system where a state laboratory or CDC only had the capacity to process 40 to 60 tests a day. Now with the commercial labs, literally those labs are processing tens of thousands of tests every day. And so while we're continuing to distribute test kits around the country, now because of the partnership with, uh, with companies like Roche and, and Quest uh, and uh, LabCorp, uh, the American people are seeing the results of those tests more rapidly than at any point in the past, and we expect that will continue to expand. But the exciting news this weekend about Abbott Laboratories having a 15-minute test approved is going to put us in a position we believe down the road to get to where Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks want us to be for many of the states that don't yet have significant outbreak. There's some 19 states where we don't have significant outbreak, but we want to be doing the kind of surveillance testing in those states that will allow us early on to identify people with the coronavirus, do what the experts call contact tracing, and ensure that in that state we don't have, we don't have a, an outbreak of the coronavirus. So, In many countries all over the world want to know whether or not they can use, especially our new test that we that was just developed by Abbott, which is almost instantaneous, which is going to be great. And remember this, we inherited, the word is we inherited bad tests. We really inherited bad tests. These are horrible tests. And it was broken. It was all broken. And we fixed it. And we're doing millions of tests. Sometimes we send out a test and it's not used. In many cases, it wasn't used. But we worked with the states and the testing has been pretty amazing, especially considering the fact that we inherited a very broken system. Jeff? Mr. President, just to follow up on something you said before, are you considering a temporary ban on all domestic flights? Uh, I am looking at hotspots. I am looking where flights are going into hotspots. Some of those, uh, some of those flights I didn't like from the beginning. But closing up every single flight on every single airline, that's a very, very, very rough decision. But we are thinking about hot spots where you go from spot to spot, both hot. And uh, we'll let you know fairly soon. And what about rail travel? Uh, a similar thing. Uh, we have uh, trains going back and forth, and people don't think of trains, but we do a lot of transportation business. It's a very big decision to do that. And we're pretty late in the process from the standpoint that this is starting. You're going to start seeing, I think, over the next couple of weeks, you're going to start to see us hit a top and start coming down. So we'll make those decisions. Those are very, very, those are very, very big decisions from the standpoint of, uh, of the future of our country, in a way, in the future of our country. Uh, we have to get our country back. We have to start moving again. We have to start working again. Uh, they're doing tests on airlines, very strong tests for getting on, getting off. Uh, they're doing tests on trains, getting on, getting off. But when you start closing up entire transportation systems and then opening them up, that's a very tough thing to do. Just one more follow-up, please. There continues to be a lot of public confusion about the use of masks. What is the way? The reuse. I love the sterilization of the masks. So, Ohio company, you can sterilize a. The N95, you can, you can sterilize that mask for up to 20 times. Think of that, up to 20 times. We're throwing them out. And they're very expensive masks. They're throwing them out. And I kept saying, one of the first questions I asked to Dr. Fauci, I said, why aren't they sterilizing or cleaning the mask? Because I didn't, you know, was it my thing exactly when we first heard about this? Nobody else knew it either. And now we have a, a company, and I guess a number of companies, one in Ohio, a great one, that makes equipment where you can sterilize a mask up to 20 times, which is fantastic. Well, okay. What about you or me? What, what about the public? Should we be wearing masks out? We've heard lots of uh, different recommendations. I, I don't believe, look, there's a big thing. A lot of people don't like it. Uh, some people don't like it because you're taking it away from the medical professional. Some people don't like it for other reasons. I don't see where it hurts. 
And it doesn't have to be a mask. It can be a scarf. Scarf is highly recommended by the professionals. I don't see where it hurts. I think, it, frankly, if people wanted to do it, uh, we don't want to do anything that's going to take masks. You're talking about a tremendous amount of masks when you do that. We don't want to take them away from our medical professionals. But I certainly don't see it hurting. But what I do see people doing now is using scarves. And I think in a certain way, depending on the fabric, I think in a certain way a scarf is better. It's actually better. Mr. President, Mr. President. Yeah, please, you, you didn't guess. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mr. President. I wanted to ask you about social distancing and how it applies to religious uh, organizations. Yeah. Some churches, as you know, have continued to hold services, even though you have advised people that they need to practice social distancing. There was a pastor of a mega church in Florida over the weekend who held services that were that were attended by several hundred people. So my question to you is, should pastors be holding services in the middle of this pandemic? And even if they do, should Americans be going to Well, church? my biggest disappointment is that churches can't meet in a time of need. You know, this is really a great time for churches to be together, for people to get together on a Sunday or whenever, any day and meet. And yet, if you do that, if you do it close, you're really giving this invisible enemy a very big advantage. So uh, it's, it's the biggest, I think the single biggest disappointment is you can't, one of the reasons I said, wouldn't it be great just to, to pick a date as, uh, you know, I called it aspirational, an aspirational date would be Easter. Uh, and uh, I will tell you, it's, a, it's very, very disappointing. But again, you get too close, and if somebody's sick, you're going to probably catch it. So you have to be very careful. Did they cancel? Yeah, just real, real quickly, uh, Joe Biden's campaign came out with a statement today saying Sleepy that Biden, Biden would be Did open. he write the statement, or did some PR person write it? As far as I know, the campaign was wide awake, sir, and he sent, they sent out a Good. statement that For Joe change. Biden would be open to having a phone call with you to talk about the coronavirus That's pandemic. Okay, sure. Would you take his call? Oh, would you, absolutely. I'd you would to, talk to him I'd about it. I'd like to speak to him, sure. I'd like to, I'd be in I mean, he should be able together. to I, I always have him to be a nice guy. I don't know him very well, frankly, but I think he's probably a nice guy. No, if he'd like to call, I'd absolutely take his call. Okay, you could tell him. All right. But, but you have talked about the failings of the Obama administration in leaving you with empty shelves and no plans. Well, they have, and, they and no ammunition. They, they have said you got no rid ammunition. of the pandemic office and the National Security Council. Well, we didn't do that. That turned out to be a false story. Now you're starting to go, uh, no, 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 what, are you working for CNN? Out. I'm pointing out what they have said and what you have said. You do it with all. Fox. The Fox isn't so easy either. Don't kid yourself. Mr. President, I, Mr. President. Hey, look, look, John, let me tell you something. You know that's a false story. What you just said is a false story. This doctor knows it better than anybody. No, but you shouldn't be repeating a story that you know is false. All right, who, who's next? Please go ahead. In the back, you didn't get it. And Iran is struggling with the virus. It's very sad what's happening in Iran. broken economy. Under which conditions would you consider suspending U.S. sanctions? Well, look, uh, we have to talk to them. I think we could work out a deal with Iran very quickly. All they have to do is call. I just think that, you know, they're proud people, and the leadership is proud. They're proud, like all of us. We're proud. You people are proud. They're having a hard time picking up the phone, or they're having a hard time setting up the meeting. But they could fix their country pretty easily. And we don't want hostility. But if they are hostile to us, they're going to regret it like they've never regretted anything before, as per today's statement. But all they have to do is call or have somebody call. You know, there are channels where we can deal very easily. Again, I think that John Kerry did a tremendous disservice. I think he violated the Logan Act 100 percent. That's what I think. And I think it made it tough for them because they were dealing with him for years. It was a terrible deal. All of that money, $150 billion plus cash, plus cash, plane loads of cash for a deal that was no good and was short term. Essentially, it was a short term deal. Who makes a deal for that kind of money? and $1.8 billion in cash. I don't even know what that would look like. That would be this room would have to be filled up five times with $100 bills, OK? Who, who makes a deal like this? And then on top of it, the deal's no good. All right, how about one or two more? An Mr. 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 President, Mr. President um, Seattle police have reported a surge in calls about domestic violence. A number of groups have raised concerns. About Mexican violence? Uh, domestic violence. Uh, <clears throat> a number of groups have concerns that the longer people are stuck at home, the more domestic violence cases there are going to be. Do you share those concerns and what is being done well, to make sure? It's another cost of, uh, of not 
getting our country working. I mean, people are — now, some people are getting along great. I've also had the, op the exact opposite question. People, families are coming together. They're actually coming together. They haven't talked for a long time, and now all of a sudden they're talking again. They're loving each other. So I've heard that, too. But I also have heard domestic violence much, you know, at a higher level. And drug use, because of, in this case, they'd lose their jobs. They had a great job. They had a great life. They have a great family. All of a sudden, a husband's told that he doesn't have a job anymore and he's got no money. And that brings drugs into it. That brings suicide into it. It's a terrible thing. We have to get our country going again. We did the right thing. We had no choice. We did the right thing. Other countries tried to use the herd or the herd mentality. It's just, uh, you know, something that doesn't work. If you look at, I mean, just to say, I heard Sweden gave it a shot, and they went they, — they saw things that were really frightening, and they went immediately to shutting down the country. We did the right thing, and we did it early. We did it early. And we stopped other people from coming into our country early. But, but no, that's a cost. That's a tr I've been talking about that. People say, what are you talking about? But you will have. You'll have that. You'll have domestic violence. You'll have violence. You'll have suicide. You'll have drug addiction. A, a lot of people are going to be lost. We want to get this open as soon as we can. I mean, I'll be the happiest person. So will you, everyone in this room. Happy when we get the word that this is the time. And we have our common sense. And they'll give me a decision or they'll be making certain statements, and I'll, I think I'll know how to interpret those statements very well. I'll be with Mike. I'll be with the task force. I'll be with a lot of very talented people, including the two people on stage with us. But I look forward. That'll be a great day. That'll be a great day. All right. How about one more, please? Can I ask a question about uh, Mr. Wolf? Can I ask a question for sure. Mr. Wolf? Sure. Sure. What is the current contingency plan in ICE detention centers where cases of COVID-19 are already popping up? Some people have been released. Is there a, a contingency plan, and would you release the most, most vulnerable people, like children and the elder? Well, ICE uh, looks at, uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, even well before COVID, on looking at certain detention facilities and determining on a case-by-case -case basis if they need, do need to release individuals. And when we do that, we often put them on alternatives to detention as well. Uh, in the case of COVID, we're looking at vulnerable populations. And again, ICE is doing that in conjunction with CDC and other medical professionals. And in some cases, we, we do need to do that for the health and safety and the well-being of those detainees. But again, that's a case-by-case -case basis. We're not going to make any blanket statement that we're going to release individuals of whole groups a at a time. So uh, it's really important, and I've said it th uh, twice now, it's a really a case-by-case -case basis determining the health of that uh, particular population or detainee. The, the facility they're in, d uh, different facilities have different uh, capabilities, whether it's an ICE-owned facility or it's a contractor-owned facility. And so we're certainly doing that. Uh, we're doing that today. Uh, we're d we've done, been doing that for the, the past several weeks. Did you say how many have been released? While you're up, could you talk about how tight that southern border is right now? Please? Absolutely. We have uh, we continue to build uh, miles of the wall every day. We're up to uh, over 150, I believe. Uh, we're continuing to build uh, new new miles of wall. Uh, and a lot of folks ask about uh, replacement wall or new miles. Uh, and it's a new capability on the on our southwest border that we haven't had before. And so whether you talk to the agents, the Border Patrol agents, uh, they like that capability, like they like that impedance and denial that it provides them. And it provides the ability for those agents to focus elsewhere on parts of the border that are very difficult to patrol so we can use our resources uh, in a different way. And so we see a lot of benefits uh, from the border wall system. And again, that includes not only the physical infrastructure, but the cameras, the roads, the lightings, the fi fiber optic cables. Uh, and we're looking forward and we're still well on our uh, track, uh, well on our uh, mark to meet uh, 400, 450 miles by the end of the calendar year. Yeah. What actions are you taking? Um, Mr. Sorry. Wolf, can I get one more question from you while you're here? Um, there's been concern among farmers about being able to get enough migrant labor to keep the food supply moving as we go into the harvest season. What are you doing to address that? Well, at the direction of the vice president and the task force, uh, we are looking at a number of different options with the H-2A workers that you mentioned on, on how do we either extend 
uh, the validity of their uh, visa or looking at a couple of different options. Nothing to announce here today, but again, at the direction of the president and the vice president, we're looking at a very a variety of different options that I think we will have soon uh, and it'll be very beneficial. What about but but I am glad you asked that question, question because uh, we want the farmers, they've had this for years, we want the farmers to be able to get the people that have been working those farms for years or we're not going to have farms. So they're going to come in and they're going to be given a certain pass and we're going to check them very, very closely, especially over the next month. Because remember, after a month or so, I think once this passes, we're not going to have to be hopefully worried too much about the virus. But we want them to come in. We're not closing the border so that we can't get any of those people to come in. They've been there for years and years, and I've given the commitment to the farmers they're going to continue to come. Or we're not going to have any farmers. Okay? Yeah, one more question. Who are you with, by the way? I'm with Boys of America, so Why? we're not waiving visa restrictions Amazing. on immigrant workers. Okay, who, who else, please? In less than 24 oh, hours, sir, two ships will arrive at Fort Everglades with people who are in We're looking at the two ships, yeah. Should we have... Uh, we have... Uh, Canada notified, a lot of Canadians, a lot of British on the ship, and they're coming to take the people that are on the ship back to their homeland. Uh, Canada's coming, uh, UK is coming, and we have a, a lot of, and we have Americans. Uh, we have some people that are quite sick, and we're taking care of that. I'm speaking with the governor about that a lot, and uh, it's a tough situation. It's a tough situation, you know, you can understand you have people that are sick on those ships and states don't want to take, they have enough problems right now, they don't want to take them. But we have to, from a humane standpoint, we don't have a choice. It's like, I don't want to do that, but we have to. People are dying. So they will be led into the country. We're going to do something, we're going to do something. Uh, at a minimum, we're sending medical teams on board the ships. We're taking the Canadians off and giving them to uh, Canadian authorities. They're going to bring them back home. Uh, the same thing with the UK. But we have to help the people. They're, they're in big trouble, no matter where, no matter where they're from. Uh, happen to be Americans, largely Americans. But whether they were or not, I mean, they're dying. So we have to do something. So and, and the governor knows that, before too. Before being sent on? Well, we're sending a lot of them home. Yeah, we're sending a lot of them home to their countries. But we'll be doing something, and we'll be announcing it. You'll see what we're doing. But we're also uh, putting medical staff onto the ships so that we can. Uh, we have to take care of the people. Mr. Oh, President, at the risk of getting chewed out again. No, you won't. <laughs> you know. uh, Mr. President, there, there is a. The IRS is requiring people who don't normally file income tax to file a simple income tax return in order to get their twelve hundred dollar check. Is, is that the way it's going to be, or is there something you can do to I had heard that. Now, I don't know. Do you know that answer, Mike? No, we're looking IRS issued some guidance. Yeah. It sounds like it. It's I mean, not in the we'll get, but it's We can get back. Yeah, it's being. It's a process that they're working on. We'll get back to you as soon as we find out. All right, one more, please. Mr. President, you spoke with President Bolsonaro of Brazil today. I did. I spoke to him. Twitter. He's great. He's a great guy, and uh, he's uh, doing a wonderful job. He's From Brazil. He's spoke to him this morning. So and just a very... Complimentary call. He's working very hard. He's got a problem with the virus. He's got a big problem, and he's. Uh, we talked about it today at length. We had a call this morning, and uh, Brazil is shut down, as you know. They weren't going to shut it down, but they had to. Uh, so Brazil is shut down. The world is shut down. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. The entire world is shut down. You go from having the most powerful economy in the world and from other countries that are doing well, to being everything is shut down. It's very sad, but we're going to get it going, and we're going to be stronger than ever. I really believe that. We're going to be stronger. We're going to have a big bounce, a very big bounce when this is gone. And I just want to thank the American people. I want to thank these great professionals, and I want to thank the media, because really, for the most part, the media has been very fair. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.